It's a bird. It's a coat hanger. It's getting a makeover. Hello and welcome to my channel. So today I'm going to be showing you how I transformed this really strange, sad looking bird, some sort of bird, metal hanger into a super epic cool dragon hanger for my gigantic keychain. The original bird is made out of some kind of metal. Um, it's like, I don't know, steel or something. So I decided that I wasn't going to try to carve into it at all. So I had to just work off of the actual piece itself, which gave it its own unique challenge. I'm using epoxy sculpt, which is a two part epoxy putty. And if you use water, silicon sculpting tools and wooden tools, in addition to your fingers, you'll find that it's pretty moldable. It does have a limited amount of working time. I probably only get about an hour out of it before it's just not doing what I want anymore. But as you can see, I'm building up in layers on the base, getting my basic shape in and then bulking up and adding more where I want it, pressing in details, molding it in with my fingers, using a bit of water. Water's really good for smoothing out the texture of epoxy sculpt and it can be tacky, especially in the first 15 minutes or so. And the water helps prevent it from sticking to tools and fingers. I do recommend wearing gloves, at least when you mix it. I have pretty sensitive skin. I would wear gloves the entire time because sometimes it still upsets my skin in the first 15 minutes or so of it having been mixed together because there's a chemical reaction going on. But for the most part, if I mix it with gloves on my hands and then give it about five minutes of just resting and not touching it, when I touch it again, usually I can get away with not having gloves on. I just wash my hands really well when I'm done. Now that I've got the basics of the face done, I'm moving on to the chest and belly plates. I really like front plates on dragons, like their chests. They have like large triangular long plates. I tend to put it on a lot of dragons that I sculpt or draw. This one was no different. I'm just using my wooden sculpting tools to make sure that the angles are the degree that I want them and are nice and sharp. Kind of hard to tell because I did make this piece over the course of about two weeks, but I did do this in consecutive layers. So starting with just coating the bird with the simple shapes that I wanted to bulk up and then just letting it sit for a few hours so that it would cure enough for me to put another layer on and then building up more and more until I get into detail. So if you notice that some of it is a lighter gray and some of it's a darker gray or that I'm pushing in some areas and not touching others because some of it's cured and some of it's not.
So now that I've got the basics done, I decided I wanted to move on to eyes. And for the eyes, I really like to make things look more alive by giving them resin eyes. Or if I paint them, then I usually coat them in resin to make them look more watery. So I'm just grabbing this really nice multi cabochon mold that gives me lots of options for sizes. I'm using UV resin and my UV light. You can see I've got some little ones that I did here, and then I did some slightly larger ones, but I ended up going with the smallest ones in the ends because of the size of eyes that I wanted. So I'm just putting a little ball of blue tack on a cork, and now I'm going to paint the back side of the cabochon to custom hand paint my eyes. You don't have to do this. You could find eyes online and print them, and then just cut out little circles and essentially glue them onto the back of the cabochon. But if you want something really unique or you want to try out hand painting them, you can do this. I'm just using a toothpick for a lot of us. You could also use a pointed silicone sculpting tool and essentially doing, if you look really close at irises online or, or even your own in the mirror or someone close to you without freaking them out, <laughs> um, you can just take a look and see that irises are very liney veiny. Well, not veiny. They're, they have little lines, squiggly lines in them and they're all different colors. So I'm just taking the colors that I want and putting it on various things that will make very fine lines so silicone sculpting tool that's a cone tip so real pointy the toothpick and then I have that paintbrush that's the fan brush style here you can see now my eye is done I'm going to test fit and mark with a pen around the outside of my eye so that I can proceed to the next step. Here's a mask. Always recommend putting on a mask. And here's my mini engraver with a pointed stone tip edge. It's got three settings. I put it on the highest and I'm just grinding away at the finished epoxy sculpt because it's quite hard. And I want my eye to sit into the face a bit more than it will if I leave the clay as it is. I'm doing this out my window if you're wondering why the background's suddenly weird. Now that my test eye has shown that it fits well, I'm just using my E6000 glue and I'm gluing my finished eyes into place. To avoid having to do this, you could have eyes ready in advance, which I did not do, and press them into the clay. But I didn't know exactly what size eyes I was going to use at the time, and I just had gotten on with sculpting and thought about it after the fact that I needed the eyes to be in a bit more on what I had already sculpted. But it worked out just fine. As you can see, this stuff is quite easy to sand or grind away, so as long as it's been cured for 24 hours, you can do the same thing I did. Now I'm just adding spikes and horns because what dragons complete without spikes and horns. Eyelids are what really bring eyes on sculptures to life. Well, that and using resin or something that's a glossy top coat that gives them that wet look. So definitely recommend resin and or a gloss top coat if you're doing eyes. But other than that, always give them eyelids of some sort. Even if it's a creature that doesn't have eyelids, they still have uh, an area around the eye that kind of holds it in place or that surrounds it, I guess I should say. So like if you look at a snake, for example, they do still have a area of scales around the eye that's quite different. And there's actually a clear ocular scale over their eye. So you don't necessarily think about these kinds of things when you look at them, but when you're sculpting something and you want it to look realistic, you need to keep those things in mind. I do actually have a dragon eye sculpting video that I did to make, I do pins and pendants and stuff like that. If you're interested in seeing more of how to make an up close detailed eye, which includes everything from painting the back of another cabochon that's larger and using polymer clay instead of epoxy sculpt, feel free to check that out. Probably do some more of those in the near future. 
I'm just adding on more epoxy sculpt as my layers cure to get more and more detail. And I'm using the silicone tip sculpting tool to make sure that I've got really good fine details that will come out much later in the painting process. So for all of my spikes and horns, I'm doing little lines and serrations and stuff like that. Now moving on to start the scales on the body. There's many different ways that you can do scales. You could do individual if you want it to take forever but look extremely unique. You could use different tools to give them a different look or there's different ways and styles of scales as well themselves. So if you want pointy scales, you might want to use a pointier tool, etc., etc. So I just used the round silicone sculpting tool and pressed in to make like little scallop shapes on a worm of clay that I pressed somewhat flat on the side. Here I'm just adding some spike details under the eye. Just did a worm of clay and for this one I'm using my angled silicone sculpting tool and I'm making basically little triangles to make it look like little spikes. You can see on the neck, I've already done a second row of those scales as well. I did the same thing on both sides, so I'm only bothering to show you one side at a time that I'm doing rather than show sculpting or, well, attempting to identical sculpt on the opposite side. I'm sure anyone that's sculpted before knows that it's not easy to make things look identical like it is in some of the programs where you can just do the duplicate, replicate, I forget what it's called, makes it match on the opposite side. It's not like that in real life. It can be quite frustrating at times, but nobody's face is perfectly symmetrical, right? Using more tools, I've got this wire brush tool. I guess it's a brush. And I'm just poking in little holes all over the scales. And then I'm using it to brush in one direction up all the horns. Again, just another layer of texture. It's quite fine, but it will show up at the very end when everything's been painted. For the little tiny spikes, I'm just rolling little cones and then I'm pressing the fat end onto the base and using my pointed silicone sculpting tool to press the fatter flat end of the cone down onto the piece. And I do the same thing for any of the more spiky horns. They're just different size cones when I start out. Also, when I do horns in particular, I like to give them a bit of a fatter base, like what it's growing out of, I guess, or maybe like a cuticle. So I use the rounded silicone sculpting tool and just press in with the tip to make a sort of bulbous edge around the bottom of all of the horns. Or I just add a worm of clay around the bottom and then bulk it up like I did for the large two head horns. But all the ones that you see along the cheek chin area are actually just, I pressed it in. I do a similar thing with teeth 
but if gums aren't showing, then I don't add that little bit. If they are showing, then I do. So for this, the gums aren't showing because they're just sort of snaggle teeth sticking out of its lip edge. And now because the cheek area had already cured, I add a very thin pancake piece of clay that I just pressed out with my fingers and then use the rounded silicone sculpting tool to do very similar to what I did with the side scales, the large scalloped ones. And I just use that to press in the scales all around. And I do little details like this randomly all over the face as well, wherever I want more texture. Like I'm doing it in front of the eyes and on top of the nostrils and stuff like that. You can see I've done the back. I just finished doing the scales, those scallop scales all the way around, and then I added some spikes straight up the back to match what I'm about to do on the front and top of the head. I don't think you can ever have too many spikes on a dragon. It's just sort of what you feel like tolerating and what you can deal with as far as curing times as well. The nice thing about epoxy sculpt is if you just let it sit for an hour, you can have some decently cured, hard enough things and details already done, and then just go in after an hour and do some more that are very close to the ones that you just finished. So you can actually add a ton of detail quite easily with this, as opposed to Sculpey or any polymer clay, where you basically have to keep baking it or take your luck and have it not be cured. Multiple bakes can become difficult because you can accidentally, as I frequently do, over bake them, potentially under bake them as well, and end up making it brittle. Or in general, it's just, it's easier to bump and mess up what you've done before. It's much more fragile than epoxy sculpt and I haven't used epoxy sculpt a ton but the amount that I have used it I've been really liking it. This is my second piece that I've done with it. The first one is the other trash to treasure video that I did of the chubby tiger which came out awesome but was a much simpler shape. I didn't do crazy fine details like this because it was mostly just fat and round so it was pretty easy to just get those rounded shapes on and learn how to smooth as opposed to this where I was experimenting a lot more with fine detail and pressing things in and doing different levels of detail as well and using a lot of different tools. So I've decided at this point it's spiky enough and I'm done with the details, so I'm gonna move on to painting. Because I've decided that this is essentially going to be a large representation of my fairy dragon from my homebrew tabletop roleplay game. I decided that it's going to be the same color scheme as that fairy dragon. So he's red at the base of his scales and then he's a really, really dark purple that's like almost a black. But because he's a fairy dragon, I imagine that he's very metallic glittery as well. So I used my folk art color shift purple paint and I'm mixing it with black to do a wet but so it's not a wet brush but it's it's a heavily loaded paintbrush of this paint over the dried red that i coated really thoroughly over the entire piece 
and I'm just brushing in the direction of all of the scales and textures and horns that I did so that it doesn't seep into the cracks where the red is so it gives it that underlying look almost kind of like how you would paint if you wanted to do lava something that's like glowing underneath so if you just go in the direction that the angled scales and horns are going it will only put the paint on the top and not the bottom so it was just being really careful and focusing on the direction of everything. And I decided that the hook part, I basically just left alone, honestly. I, I didn't do anything to it, I just painted it because I felt that it went well enough with how the dragon looked that it was fine for the tail. And I'm just doing lots and lots of coats of this darkened blackish purple, trying to make sure that I put it heavier on the flat places that have no texture, and then making sure that I follow the direction plan with the rest of it. And again, it's, it's a heavily loaded brush of paint, but I haven't wet the paint at all, so it won't seep into crevices where I don't want it, but it will go on really thickly with a lot of pigment. And I decided that the large head horns would just be purple, so they don't have any red on them. I tried in areas that I knew I didn't want any of the red to, to just remove that red paint from the beginning. I just used a, a wet brush. It wasn't a big deal because I went over this so many times that it wouldn't have mattered even if the red got somewhere I didn't want. So now that the blackened purple is done, I'm going in with just straight purple. So this is just straight out of the bottle and I'm trying to kind of do a faded effect in certain areas where I want it to just be a lighter purple in some areas and then a just faded effect of the lighter purple in others. So the scales all over, all of the horns and the chest plates and the spikes and the scales, I want to slowly fade and get lighter and lighter. And once I've got two coats of just the straight purple done, I move on to a lightened purple that is a dry brush. So I mix a little bit of white in with the same folk art purple, and then I brush my brush on a paper towel and then lightly go over details that I want on the piece. So thinking tips of things, right? So tips of the horns, tips of the spikes, all of the edges of the chest plates and the side scales and stuff like that. Once I've got that done, I'm just going and doing all the rest of the little details. So I'm giving it white teeth and I'm doing a black edging on the inside of the eyes just to kind of make the eyes pop more. This is just straight black paint on a really fine brush. And then it was a little too light and I wanted to make my detail pop even more. So my last step is a black wash. So this is black acrylic paint with a ton of water. And there's lots of different techniques people have to do this. I honestly do it a different way every time. Sometimes I put it on really thick and I try to blot it back off. Sometimes I try to control which direction it flows and just anything extra that drips off. I put onto a paper towel or maybe I even put the wash in certain places and not others or I go back in with just a watered brush and try to control the flow or move it in certain spots. I kind of did that with this where I just loaded it with black wash in a lot of places except as I got onto the very top of the head I started to control where I was putting it because I wanted it to be a little bit lighter on top. But that does it for the paint, and here's my finished piece.
Well, that's it from me. I hope you enjoyed this. If you'd like to see more of me making my art, please like, follow, and subscribe.